Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Mahler's uh, Corneal GP Wave in Multifocals and Addressing Presbyopia. Uh, Dr. Mahler, go ahead and take it away. Actually, one final thing. Uh, if you have any questions, don't forget to enter them as soon as you can, and we'll address them at the end tonight. Dr. Mahler, go ahead and take it away. Thanks a lot, Carver. Uh, and welcome to all that have come out to uh, learn about uh, GP multifocals and uh, what we need to do in WAVE so we can address the presbyopic population. Um, and uh, I think we have uh, some interesting stuff that we're going to get to tonight. So let's get started. All right, first, uh, to get out of the way, I do consult for um, uh, both Oculus and WAVE. Uh, my practice is a solo private contact lens only practice, and it primarily is centered around irregular corneas. Uh, the regular corneas I see are pretty much all in ortho K. Uh, I have done previous uh, clinical support for WAVE on a case by case basis, uh, and I also do present a WAVE information through lectures and webinars just like this one tonight. Uh, on the private practitioner side, I do consultation services, which I will uh, put up a slide at the end. So if anyone of you are interested in, uh, there's case-by-case -case help, one-on-one -on -one training or phone help, uh, even in person. And it all really comes down to some remote fitting and the telemedicine techniques to get your patient successful uh, remotely. Uh, I do beta testing for both the uh, CSP WAVE and uh, the AXL uh, WAVE hardware. Uh, as well as uh, in a few weeks, I will be going to uh, Germany to uh, work with the engineers to hopefully get even more uh, fantastic development out of uh, both the hardware and software for us to develop even better contact lens uh, designs for our patients. Uh, I did author the first uh, certified WAVE designers program, and I'm currently guiding the WAVE training. All right, so yes, we are on the last one on this list, the corneal GP wave multifocals addressing presbyopia. And so let's get started here. So why discuss wave corneal GP multifocals anyway? What's the big deal? Well, this is an entirely underserved, enormous population. There are a lot of people out there that would benefit with this particular product. Uh, in the US in 2021, 73 million millennials turned 40 and they joined 61 million people in Generation X who are already aged between 41 and 56. So just take a look at those numbers for a second. That's a lot of people that can benefit by this particular type of technology. Uh, the vast majority, 96%, are impacted by symptoms with 46% uh, reporting that they're extremely affected. And interestingly, when I was preparing this, I came across this particular a study that had uh, taken a look at this uh, survey that was put out uh, by way of Facebook. Um, and take a look at what these people are complaining about. Uh, you've got the low light issues, the menus. Uh, they can't read their medication bottles and labels, uh, newspapers and books. Uh, and again, the, you know, the computers and the social media and the text, the, the, these are all of the daily activities that this population is really struggling with. So what options are available to presbyopes currently? Well, we've got spectacles, and those are in bifocals, uh, you know, flat top blendeds, progressives. Uh, we can get into digital uh, spectacles and things like that. Uh, moving on to contact lenses, we have soft lenses, corneal GP lenses, scleral lenses, and those are available really in three flavors. So regardless of which type of contact lenses we're talking about, it all comes down to these three uh, choices. Either you are going to set the patient up with single vision distance vision uh, and then give them a pair of over spectacles veneer. You'll put them into monovision or bifocal or multifocal contact lenses. Uh, there's also some combinations of that and there are a, a very, very few exceptions to this, uh, but those are more special cases. I'm talking about the masses. Uh, we could talk about orthokeratology for uh, the presbyopes as well. Um, a lot of the newer orthokeratology docs don't go anywhere near adults and certainly don't even think about uh, dealing with a presbyope, uh, but this is a, a valid uh, option for the presbyopes. Uh, refractive surgery, LASIK, et cetera, multifocal and movable IOLs, corneal inlays. Uh, I'm not really going to get into the refractive surgical aspects here and the 
pros and cons of all that, uh, but I do mention that here. And then, of course, the very last option is just stop doing all close work. Um, and sadly enough, uh, if you talk to some presbyopes, this is actually how they've addressed their problem because their doctors have not addressed the problem for them. So these are some of the points that we need to consider when we're dealing with this population. Nothing's going to restore a healthy 10-year-old eyes function. That's, that's off the table. Uh, I wish it weren't. If it weren't, uh, I would corner the market on dealing with presbyopes because we just get them all back to uh, the way a nice 10-year-old accommodation system works, but that's just not, uh, it's not, it's not an offerable option at this stage. Presbyopia is progressive, so that means whatever you've done today is probably not going to work tomorrow, or even if it works tomorrow, it's not going to work the day after that. Dry eye, much more common in the presbyopes, and certainly that's a, that's a whole topic of its own. 85% of eyes have some cylinder. So depending on how much cylinder uh, is, is present, this can be a problem when trying to get uh, someone into a contact lens option. Cylinder becomes more important to correct in presbyopia. How often have you seen a 20-year-old with three quarters or maybe one diopter of cylinder, and you can get them into a sphere without a problem, yet that same person at 45 years of age with the same three quarters of a one diopter cylinder, all of a sudden now it's important to correct it because accommodation just doesn't help them get through without it. Different presbyopes do have different needs, so it's important to interview the patients to understand the specifics of what you're trying to address. Uh, good distance vision is commonly needed, and especially uh, night vision. So that's, that is an important um, uh, parameter that we can sort of leave off the table. Uh, we need stable vision for the entire day, and sometimes for very long hours. Some of them are working at uh, computer stations eight, nine, 10, 11 hours of a day, uh, and then they have to drive home at nighttime. So they need the stable vision all day long. Near vision, mid-range, computer vision, these are very, very complex issues because of all the different distances, the different types, the different uh, fonts, the different lighting conditions. All of these things can be very problematic to address. Uh, some of them may have worn contacts, but as soon as they entered presbyopia, they stopped. Pupil size decreases with age. Uh, on this list, that's probably the one thing that actually works in our favor in dealing with the presbyopia. Uh, because the smaller pupil size actually increases depth of focus. Uh, lids lose their tonicity with age. Again, this is another problem that both contributes to the dry eye issue, as well as also the positioning of multifocals on, on the uh, surface of these eyes so that they sit in the correct area. Uh, retinal sensitivity decreases with age. So uh, they typically do need more light uh, in order to be able to function properly. All right, so we've got the evil monster presbyopia. There is no silver, silver lining. I'm a pretty positive kind of fellow, but there's no positive to presbyopia. It's just all bad. Uh, so let's talk about what the true definition of presbyopia is. Certainly from a physician standpoint, we all know what's really going on, but from the patient's perspective, what really is presbyopia? It's all about compromise. Since we can't restore back that 10-year-old functioning eye, whatever we're going to uh, offer to the presbyope is going to be some form of compromise. It doesn't matter what the option is, none of our options are as good as a 10-year-old accommodating eye. So let's talk about reading spectacles over contacts. That was that first option, and that's a hassle. Uh, because they need it. And quite honestly, if they're going to need the reading glasses over the contacts, why just not wear the spectacles altogether? Uh, since wearing the contact lens and glasses together, you're increasing risk and uh, increasing the hassle, but they're not really getting the reward because they're still tied to a pair of glasses all, all the time. Monovision is sacrifices stereo vision. That doesn't mean that they can't be successful but it does sacrifice stereo vision and in a GP multifocal you will have superior visual performance as compared with monovision. Economics, 
is also superior with GP multifocals compared with soft disposable lenses for monovision. And I just, I just love this little uh, cartoon over here. Uh, okay, let's move on. So why waive corneal GP multifocals? Well, GP multifocal is really the best contact lens only option as it compromises the least of any optical correcting option that you can present to the presbyopia. It provides excellent vision. You do have proper stereo vision. You can get great distance near and mid-range vision and also address the computer needs. It's incredibly cost-effective for the patient. We can also achieve that excellent full day performance. The other thing also, and this was brought up by a patient to me, you know, sometimes we get caught up in our day to day and we sort of forget, you know, from the patient's side, some of the things that they notice and observe. And so this was Tony's story. There's a link there if you want to jot that down. Uh, when you get a chance, you can go ahead and read what he had to say. But in essence, he pointed out to me just how wonderful he was doing in his GP multifocals compared to his office workers who were all working with soft contact lenses and did not get the day-to-day -day dependability that he was able to get, and certainly not for the full day. Uh, the GP multifocals are very simple uh, to care for. They're very easy to handle, and the maintenance is very simple as well. So how do you present this to the patient? Are you going to go ahead and tell them that, well, initially, the wear is going to be painful. You'll, you'll love all the vision and everything's going to be great, but you have to endure some pain at the beginning. And after you adapt for about a month of this, this painful experience, maybe you'll have some improved comfort. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight, that's really not the way to present this to the patient. First of all, it's not really true. Uh, but second, it's setting you up for failure right from the beginning, before you've even done a single design. All right, so some things you need to consider before you start fitting. Are they a current soft lens wearer? Are they a current gas perm wearer? What is their pupil size? We did talk about them getting smaller with time, but that's a very, very critical parameter to assess. Uh, are they nearsighted or farsighted? Uh, how's the cylinder? With the rule, against the rule, oblique? These are all issues when you're dealing with a GP lens, especially when you look at the elevations of these corneas and what it may do for the positioning of the lens. Uh, what quality are we dealing with uh, in their tear film? Uh, what are the patient's visual demands? What is it that we really have as sort of the top priorities that we're going to have to address? What are their expectations? So, you know, these might seem obvious, but this is a really, really nice checklist to sort of keep off, you know, to the side when you're going to start fitting these patients because every one of these things will take you down a slightly different path when you sit down to design up the lens. So these are really some of the questions you want answered in your head before you actually do design uh, lenses for this, these patients. Okay, in WAVE you have two types of multifocals, a center distance and center near. Um, I fit my corneal lens is very, very well aligned by choice and design. And so my order of preference is center distance first and until proven to me that it will not work. And quite honestly, that takes a long time to prove it to me that it's not going to work before I'll move to a center near design. Position and movement must be considered and is critical when fitting any multifocal. And fitting issues must be resolved before concern over power adjustments and pupil adjustments, and that is lens pupil adjustments uh, when you're dividing up both the, uh, the um, distance and near scripts on the uh, lens. So in a center distance design, what do we need to think about? Well, it absolutely must be horizontally centered. You cannot get this lens to work if it's not horizontally centered. So if you've designed up a lens, and it's sitting near their ear, don't worry about the fact that they can't see and you're going to give them an extra minus a half so they have better distance vision. You must work on getting this lens centered before you concern yourself with any powers that, are, that, that, that they're off by. Um, vertically, you really want a half to one and a half millimeters of movement tops on the blink. So you don't really want a lot of deflection of this going up and down. 
they can easily be fit uh, two millimeters up to about 0.3 millimeters smaller than the HVID. It's more difficult, but not impossible to fit smaller. So when you're looking at their, um, uh, their corneas, one of the things you're going to want to take a look at is how big is the cornea, what's the HVID, uh, and then think about where between the two millimeters and 0.3 millimeters smaller than that HVID, you want to position uh, this, the size of this lens. Uh, quality of distance vision tends to be very, very good with this. Uh, they can be fit very, very comfortably. Um, large pupils, however, can be very problematic in achieving that near vision that you're trying to get for them. And a large pupil, in um, uh, by my definition, is going to be greater than 4.8 millimeters in moderate illumination. So if you're dealing with a larger than uh, 4.8 millimeter pupil size in moderate illumination, this is this can be a really bumpy ride. The lens pupil size is used to balance the distance in near vision, and the lens pupils can be different to achieve a modified monovision approach. So again, remember, if, you, if you're dealing with a binocular patient, it's not bad if you're using different pupil sizes to kind of massage them in to get better vision. The larger lens pupil is reserved for the dominant eye, and although this is not my, uh, my initial approach, uh, if I have not achieved what I wanted to achieve with my initial design, this typically is how I'll start to troubleshoot that, giving the dominant eye the larger pupil size on the lens, whereas the non-dominant eye the smaller pupil size on the lens. Center near considerations. Distance vision is typically not as good as compared with center distance. Uh, the quality of near and mid-range, though, is very, very good. Again, horizontal positioning is absolutely a must. Uh, vertically, again, about 0.1 to 0.5 millimeters of movement on the blink. You need much, much um, better critically aligned vertical positioning of this so that it sits correctly and does not take away the distance vision. These can be fit small, but ideal for actually very large diameter designs uh think corneal scleral to scleral designs these designs tend to work much better they also can be fit very very comfortably and large pupil sizes is is still difficult but it's not nearly as problematic as with a center distance design again we use that lens pupil to balance the distance in near and again we can sort of do that troubleshooting approach that I had mentioned before, except this is the exact opposite with the modified monovision approach, because the smaller lens pupil is reserved for the dominant eye. All right, so putting it all together from topography to a design, how do we get this thing actually designed? So here's a topography of a very normal eye, and here's a wave default lens. That's sort of just how it came in. Uh, for this particular lecture, I am using the legacy software to demonstrate this. Um, it was actually just a little bit easier because the newer software doesn't quite have uh, as many of these display options that I wanted to uh, get across. However, uh, as that continues to mature, uh, a lot more of those features are going to be there as well, and so they will all be the same. But to demonstrate these principles, it was just easier on the older uh, legacy software, so that's the reason why I'm using that software during this webinar. So let's take 16 steps to, to get us successful on this particular patient. Step one, let's compare how well WAVE did representing the original source topography. So here's the source topography, and here's what WAVE thinks the topography looks like once we brought it into WAVE. And you can see WAVE's done a very, very nice job of bringing that information in uh, to represent this cornea uh, very uh, accurately. Here's the topography. We have the tangential display because that's how the lens defaults when it opens. And so we change that to an axial display. And that's where you see things have uh, sort of in the center drop down toward the uh, cornea. Uh, whereas in the tangential display, the, the uh, default lens is showing a little bit of uh, central clearance here. Next step. Evaluate the corneal diameter. Now, this is really very critical because we really need to get the size right. 
So we can do it a few different ways. We can use the grid. We can estimate the HVID by one millimeter boxes that are on that grid. And we can also take a look at the circular diameters, depending on which topographer uh, you're using. Uh, the displays look a little different and I've gone ahead and put them all up here. So on this first picture, this is a scout topography. Uh, and each of those boxes are one millimeter boxes. And so you can just count the boxes, which estimates the HVID. Uh, you can also see, however, that there are circular uh, points over here. I've put on the uh, right side the, the uh, uh, Meridia, the, the New Medmont Meridia. And you can see that um, on the Scout, we have a black circle at three millimeters. On the Meridia, it's a sort of a thicker gray line. We also have that five millimeter circle on both and we have the seven millimeter circle on both. So we have those circular diameters to give us an idea where we are on the, on the eye. Uh, and we have the uh, boxes, which again, you can see the grid boxes on the Meridia display as well, uh, where we can estimate what the actual diameter is of these uh, corneas. Uh, on the Pentacam, you can see here, there's actually two different displays. We have circular uh, displays on this one. The one on my left has the three, five, seven, nine, and 11 millimeter circular diameters, whereas the one on the right is showing the two, four, six, eight, and 10 millimeter diameters. So once again, we can estimate where we are on this particular corneum. It depends on, how, depends on exactly how you set up those displays. We can also use the caliper, uh, which is, by the way, my chosen method. Uh, and you can see I put the caliper on this scout measurement there, and it came up at 11.32, which gives me a very, very accurate uh, measurement of how large is this HVID. On the uh, Medmont, you can see that you can also do it with the caliper, and it says it right on the screen there at 12.88, which tends to be, a, that's a very large cornea. Uh, and that's a linear ruler measurement that you can do um, on, the, uh, on the Medmont. Uh, you also have a circular iris measurement, and you can see that on my lower screen on the Medmont, where it reports down right below the HVID is 12.8. So whether you did the linear or the circular, you're going to get the same, the same measurement there. Now, on the Pentacam, this is actually a very, very important point to understand. The Pentacam reports HWTW, that's white to white which is not equal to HVID. Uh, HVID tends to be a little bit smaller than the white to white measurement that the Pentacam will report on. And so what I've done is I start doing manual measurements, which you could see on the right there by putting up the iris image and measuring that straight across. You can see on this particular uh, measurement there, the white to white is measured at 11.5, yet my uh, iris measurement is actually 11.27. Uh, if you were to take the 11.5 and I designed up a lens that, for example, was 0.3 smaller, uh, what we would have, sorry, we would have there is an 11.2 lens and it would actually be sitting on the limbus and that would be a little bit too large. So I would recommend if you're using the Pentacam to actually bring up the iris image and do a manual measurement of what the white to white, not, not the white to white, what the HVID is so that you're not misled by the white to white measurement that the Pentacam is reporting on. Okay, step four, set the lens diameter. So you've got a pull down on that uh, and how we choose the diameter, like I said, if we have a new wearer, I'm typically 0.3 to 0.6 smaller than the HVID. Established wearer is a little different um, uh, set of circumstances. If they're wearing a lens that's nine millimeters or 9.2 millimeters, uh, and they have, for example, an 11.2 millimeter cornea, typically what I will do is I will uh, take the uh, size that they're wearing, the nine, let's say it's 9.2, uh, take the um, measurement of the HVID, let's say it was 11.2, and I'll split the difference between the two, and so I'd probably fit a 10.2 lens. So for a new wearer on that 11.2, I might fit a 10.9 lens, yet on the established wearer, it's only gonna be a 10.2 lens. And there's multiple reasons for that. I'm not gonna get into that now. That's actually fairly complicated. 
Uh, I then will also temper that size with any abnormalities that are on the cornea. For example, if a pterygium is encroaching onto the cornea there, sometimes you can't go quite that large. So I set the diameter. In this particular case, that eye was about 11.3, so I set the diameter at 11.0. Evaluate the symmetry that we're getting at the chosen diameter, and that's where we're going to set the symmetry. So what I've done here is I'm showing you, this is along the 0 to 180 meridian, and you will notice on the wave screen there that 20 micron line, that's the gray horizontal line. And our black line is representing our lens. I haven't done any designing yet. I'm just trying to evaluate the symmetry of this eye. And so the default lens that came up is good enough for us to evaluate the symmetry. And we could see here in this horizontal meridian, the lens is pretty much all below the 20 micron line. When we go up from the uh, location of the 0, 0180 and we rotate to 45 and 225, once again, yeah, on the inferior temporal side of 225, at the very, very edge, it's crossing the 20 micron line, but for the most part, the entire lens is still all below the 20 micron line. 90 and 270, basically the same story. The entire lens, except for the very inferior, where it just crosses the 20 micron line, is really all below the 20 micron line. And even on the oblique uh, 135, 315 degree uh, meridian, all right, so we're crossing the 20 micron line actually where that blue is, but again, it's not crossing it by very much. And so for the most part, spinning this around, I've seen that this default lens is sitting all below the 20 micron line. You might be saying, so what's the big deal about 20 microns? Bear in mind that we can't really detect fluorescein below a 20 micron tear layer thickness, which means that if I were to put this lens on the eye for the most part, this lens would look virtually perfectly aligned because we wouldn't see really any fluorescein anywhere under this lens, and I haven't even designed the lens yet. So that gives you a sense of proportion as to what does that 20 micron line have to do with the symmetry? Well, this, this cornea for the most part is actually fairly symmetrical all the way around because we really didn't cross much uh, past that 20 micron line. So in this particular case, um, I decided to take a look between the R-SIM and G-SIM and see what the differences were. So here's the R-SIM in the zero, and here it is in the G-SIM. And if we uh, take a look at the black line, again, I have not moved anything else. I just changed this from R-SIM to G-SIM. Uh, you'll notice that I'm, I'm actually a little further below the 20 micron line, getting closer to the corneal surface. So. I went ahead and set the cord location of the red ball control point. Notice I didn't say optic zone because I'm going to talk about that in a second. Choosing the red ball location, it's based on the lens diameter, it's based on the overall symmetry of this particular cornea, how much central symmetry do we have, and what is the pupil size and is that relevant? Well, it actually is relevant. Red ball does not equal optical zone in the traditional sense. So when we think about back optic zones on traditional tricurve, quadricurve lenses, that is not the same thing as the red ball. Uh, I know sloppily we really mention the red ball as an optic zone, but it really isn't. It's really just a control point. And what that means is it gives us control over the design. That's all it does. It's not, it has nothing to do with setting a back optic zone. In this particular case, I almost will always default to a 6.0 millimeter in all semi-meridians if I'm dealing with an 11 millimeter lens. Six millimeters is a really, really nice sort of average uh, location that works very well. You will notice that for the most part, the red ball is dividing the, the, um, uh, the lens really into two halves. You've got the area from the apex to the red ball, which is all the spherical optic portion of the lens. And then you've got the area from the red ball out to the periphery, which is really all about aligning the lens. And 6.0 is a really nice location for very, very normal eyes uh, that you can almost default uh, to almost always and do very well with. 
Uh, now we have to set the location for the blue ball. And again, that's a control point. It's not the intermediate curve width. So again, this is decided by lens diameter. It's decided by overall symmetry, central symmetry once again. And once again, pupil size is important here. And again, this does not mean we're setting an intermediate zone in a traditional sense. For sort of like, where's that go-to default? Set it to seven millimeters in all semi-meridians and you'll do reasonably well. Next, we wanna select create alignment tier layer. For those of you who have used WAVE and only go to configuration settings, this is a whole new concept to you, but this is where you're actually manually designing up the lens. So by setting up the create tier alignment, what you're going to do is tell WAVE, now that I've put the red ball at six and I've put the blue ball at seven millimeters, please go ahead and align this lens the very best that you can, given that's my location for those control points. And so WAVE will go through the calculations for you. You don't have to do this manually. And the way you do that is under tools, you click that create a alignment tier layer, and it will try, given that symmetry, in this case, the G-SIM, and those locations for the red and the blue ball, align this lens the very, very best it can for you. Check the new alignment that WAVE came up with. And you can see it looks very different than we had a moment ago. Assess the tier layer clearance from the apex of the edge of the lens in each of the eight semi-meridians. So here in the 0, 180, here we are in the 45, 225. Here we are in the 9270. And here the 135 and 315. And notice now that we've got those different locations and we told Wave to try and align the lens, we basically don't cross the 20 micron line at all. So we're actually doing very, very nicely getting this aligned up with this particular cornea. Now on step 10, let's check the back curvature profile. Uh, and yes, this is on the new software as well, so you can see that there as well. If this is a normal cornea that you're fitting, this profile really should be very, very smooth and have a slow, steady decrease in curvature from apex to edge. So what do I mean by that? Well, we're going to be taking a look at the specific shape of that black line to determine do we have a well-designed lens. Since we have a GSIM lens here, it's going, the profile, that profile of that black line is actually going to vary in each of the four meridians. Uh, the other four, well, the four semi-meridians on one side are going to be identical to four semi-meridians on the other side. So we only really have to check the four meridians. This right here that I've circled where the red blue ball combination are, that's our area of interest. So pay very close attention to that particular graphic there. So here in the 0, 180, here, 45 to 225, notice that just before the red ball, it's the black line is popping up and then it decreases fairly low down to get to the blue ball. Here in the 9270, also a similar kind of thing. And here in the 315, 135, also a similar kind of thing. Understand that on this back curvature uh, graphic, the uh, black line is not just a pretty picture. The black line is telling you the higher on the picture you are, the steeper the curve the lens has. The lower down you are, or the closer to the uh, bottom of the upper graphic there, the flatter the lens is getting. So here I've put the uh, on the left side, the 0 to 180 uh, default sort of create alignment lens that WAVE came up with. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to show you after I've adjusted these uh, control points to create a, a better fitting lens. So the way you do that is change the percentage selected to a quarter or 25%. So we can adjust each of those meridians individually. And again, it's a G-SIM lens, so we only have to adjust four. So on the right-hand side, you can see here, I've changed my selected to a quarter. And again, we're gonna pay attention to that area of interest to see exactly what I've changed. Now notice here on the left-hand side, that's that 45, 225 that I was commenting about the red ball just prior, the black line is going up a little bit and then it's coming down pretty quick to the blue line. Notice on the right-hand side where I adjusted those control points, I've made 
almost a very, very gently sloping shape out of that black line. It's not that quick uh, descent to the blue that it had before. Along this meridian, you'll notice the same type of thing where I have that very, very gentle slope coming down toward the flatter curves. And once again, in the 135-315, same exact thing. So next, compare the back curvature graphic with the wave corneal model and the original topography. So now that we've done a job of aligning the lens and cleaning up how the lens deals with the um, uh, changeover from the red ball, blue ball area, how good of a job have we done aligning this lens to the original topography? So here you could see the back curvature of that lens on the left. And in the middle, that was the original wave cornea that, that uh, wave brought in and interpreted from the topography. And of course, on the right, that's the topography. And you'll notice there's a real strong similarity between all three of these color graphics here. You can confirm the central alignment with the topo demand feature. Uh, and you can see here that I have two colors. Uh, there's the black that says 0 0.01 and the blue that says about a quarter diopter. What that's saying is that in the cent central area there, overall, centrally, we're perfectly aligned with, within one hundredth of a diopter. The blue is actually indicating the alignment in the flat meridian. And in the flat meridian, you could see there's a quarter diopter difference between our lens and this cornea. And so we've done a very, very nice job of getting this lined up centrally with this particular cornea. Step 13, let's compare the edge lifts now because that's a very important area here so that we can make the patient comfortable. So on this one, I've gone ahead and put the uh, graphic to show us in each of the uh, meridians, 0, 0,180, the 45, 2, 2 and a quarter, the uh, 9270, and the 135,315, what does our edge lift look like uh, on this screen and what's the value of the lift. And what you would like to do is take a look at all of these and wherever the lowest lens meridian clearance you have, so in this case it's at 6.3 microns, that really should be between 10 and 15 microns so you have proper tear exchange under the peripheral portion of this lens. So we're going to make some adjustments out in the periphery of this lens so we can fix that 6.3 microns. So adjust that in the four semi-meridians. And lo and behold, I've put these all up here. And now my lowest lens meridian clearance is now between the 10 and 15 that I was going for. You can see it's at 11.1. .1, and all the others there are really between 10 and 15. So we've really done a very nice job of getting the edge of this lens aligned properly. Step 14, let's select the multifocal style. Well, you already heard me say it, I will use the center distance until proven that it will not work. And the uh, center near can be used on a non-dominant eye to aid near function, while the center distance is on the dominant eye, but like I said at the beginning of this, I really use this more as a troubleshooting, not an initial design feature. So here I've selected center distance design. Step 15, we have to adjust the lens pupil size. So the default lens pupil always comes up as 3.6 millimeters. We have to account for where the lens is going to be positioned on this eye, how it's going to move, and the better centered it is and the less movement we have, the smaller we can make that pupil. Proper pupil selection is critical for balancing out the distance in near vision. Again, we might have to skew this balance based on patient needs. For example, uh, if you're dealing with an interstate truck driver, uh, you might really want to skew things a little bit more on the distance side. Uh, in a center distance design, that would mean that we're going to have a slightly larger pupil size on the lens than we ordinarily would have. Uh, if you've got the uh, bookkeeper or an accountant, for example, who's staring at a computer all day long, we may want to skew that a little bit smaller than an average size uh, just because we know that they have so much near need. Uh, I tend to walk the 50-50 line initially almost for everybody. 
uh, because I would rather get that on them and see exactly what I have not addressed before redesigning and start to skew things. Uh, again, I mentioned it again, the large pupils can be problematic for multifocal, so bear that in mind. The other thing that's really important that I've noticed when I've done consults over the years is that the pupil size is not given um, uh, the amount of importance uh, that it really is due. And understand that very small changes in pupil size can have an incredibly large impact on how that lens performs on the eye. So on this particular eye, we're going to assess and adjust the pupil size. So the pupil size is uh, adjusted by that red ball. And this is on the front curvature uh, map. Uh, I measured the patient pupil as 3.7 in moderate light. And the lens pupil selection being on the front curvature screen puts up that red, uh, the red ball. And I went ahead and placed it at 3.4 millimeters. So I brought that in from the 3.6 default that it came up with initially. So this is where I've set it. You can see it's 3.4 and it reports that down in the bottom there. And now let's take a look at pupil size changes to see exactly what happens to um, how we're balancing out the distance in the air. So uh, many, many years ago, I created this pupil area calculator just so I could see quickly what am I actually changing. So on the top, I have entered in the 3.6, which is where this is defaulted to. And at the bottom, I made a, uh, the new pupil size at 3.2. This is not the case I just did, uh, but just to see how much things had changed. I did the same thing for 3.6 down to 3.4, which is in fact what I just did for this particular patient. Uh, 3.6 to making it larger to 3.8, and 3.6 up to 4.0. And what you'll notice is that by changing from 3.6 to 3.4, so it was a 0.2 millimeter change, I've actually given more than 10% of the near vision away to the distance. So for example, if in fact we really had a 50-50 balance before, we now really have more of a 40-60 balance in terms of percentage. And that was only a 0.2 millimeter change. You'll also notice there down where I, I took the pupil from 3.6 up to four that we've lost about 25% of the um, uh, center distance by giving that to the near there. So these, bear in mind, these changes are very, very large, uh, even though apparently we haven't changed much in terms of the pupil size. All right, step 16, this is our last step. Let's, let's assess the center and edge thickness. Uh, think about the center thickness as the parameter that adjusts, adjusts both the stability of the material as well as the weight of the, of the lens. And the edge thickness is really the conjunctival interaction and patient sensation of the design. So in this particular case, we got center thickness of 0.18 millimeters and the edge thickness is 0.16. So let's summarize the uh, points from this case. Fit always must be the first thing that you address before balancing out anything in the powers uh, and the pupil size. In this particular case, that design that I just put up, that was perfect on the first pair. I was done with this with one pair of lenses. Uh, once it fits fine, monocularly use trial lenses in free space to force as much plus for distance and least plus for near that achieves what you're trying to achieve. This particular troubleshooting technique is vital to figure out where you need to go next when the patient's not successful in your first design. Pay very close attention to the quality of the acuity to determine how much impact the pupil size is having versus the power. And what I mean by that is that, for example, let's say you've put your lens on and they're taking a look at the distance chart and they're at 20, 25 minus in, in their dominant eye. And they say, well, the distance kind of looks blurry and you go ahead and you put up a minus a half and they get to 2025 plus, but they're still complaining that it looks blurry. The problem isn't the minus a half that you have, uh, that you've shorted them for distance. The problem is the pupil size in the lens. And so that type of complaint is gonna be solved by adjusting pupil size rather than adjusting power. The other side of this coin is 
you go ahead and you put up that chart in there, 2025 minus on the distance I, and you put up a minus a half on the distance in there, 2015, that's not pupil size. That's a power issue. And, that, and they'll tell you, oh, no, it's not blurry now at all. That looks really clear. That's telling you that it's a power problem, not a pupil problem. So pay very close attention to how they respond. This is one of those things you don't sort of um, delegate out to a tech to do. You want to do this yourself so you'll know exactly what you need to do to fix the problem. Remember, small lens pupil changes can have a large impact on the distance near balance. Consider that modified monovision approach if it's actually warranted. And don't discount the value of a little bit of time to help with the uh, acuity uh, improving. Remember, they're not accustomed to simultaneously seeing distance and near through the same bundle of uh, rays that are entering in this multifocal design. And so sometimes they do need a little bit of time, just like they would adjust to uh, progressive for the first time in dealing with a staircase. So sometimes they do need a little bit of time to adjust to it. Um, typically, the hypermetropes have very, very soft endpoints for the amount of plus that they will accept. And if you give them time, they tend to accept more, more plus. So be patient with the hypermetropes. The myops are not like that, but the hypermetropes really are. So the first, you could put the, um, for example, that, that case I just mentioned where you have, you have the hypermetrope there. You say, well, this is a little blurry. And you measure, and, and you measure their acuity and their, you know, maybe 20, 25-ish. And uh, you put up a minus a half and it doesn't really do much. You have them come back two weeks later and all of a sudden, they're 2020 crisp, and you can even get another plus a quarter or plus a half on them. And they're still 2020 crisp. So be very patient with the hypermetropes because they tend to uh, accept much more plus uh, given a little bit more time. Down at the bottom there, that's um, the uh, web address for my consult services. And these are the breakdown of those uh, in uh, five options. Uh, these services are really primarily aimed at much more advanced learning, uh, things that are off FDA approval, uh, much more elevated complexity in terms of designs and go way beyond uh, what the Wave Help Desk uh, will offer for you. Um, I have the case by case help, which is basically as the case presents to you, uh, you can share the case with me and I'll do the case for you while you sit back and learn what needs to be done. Or as some of the doctors uh, will use this type of help, uh, they'll take on a case, get into trouble, and ask me to bail them out. And so that works as well. Uh, the second is phone help per time units, and that's typically more for specific type of learning, whether it's to bail a specific case out or you, you're kind of scratching your head as to why something isn't working right. We can go over that by way of the phone. Uh, during the phone time, we also share screen so I can see exactly what's going on on your side, and then I can give you suggestions of what we need to do to fix that. One-on-one -on -one personal time, uh, that's where we target very specific uh, weaknesses and goals that you have. So, for example, uh, you feel that you're a little bit of weak, uh, weak in ortho-K and high myopes. We can spend an entire day or two full days just addressing ortho-K and, and getting high myopes taken care of properly. Uh, design and supply is not really for... Uh, wave docs, it's for non-wave docs. Uh, and then very lastly is I still do have some of the DVDs available from the Wave Winter Weekend Workshop that I had done a few years back. Uh, and th that information actually still is very, very relevant. And it's a fantastic smattering of um, virtually all types of cases that you'd be taking on uh, with Wave, whether it's ortho case, scleral lenses, regular corneas, and the like. And very last, these are the resources available to um, uh, WAVE users on the WAVE Contact Lens site. Uh, and you can see we have the WAVE page uh, that has quite a bit of information there. We have the resource with the webinars and the videos and events that are happening. And of course, the WAVE Google uh, group where it's basically an email form where cases get discussed and uh, we get peer-to-peer -peer advice there. And with that, Carver, I'm going to wrap up tonight and uh, open it up for some uh, questions. Perfect. I do have a number of questions ready for you. Just a reminder for everyone in the audience, if you do have a question that you haven't asked yet, go ahead and put that in chat right now. All right, to get us started, uh, there was some confusion when you were talking about the effect of pupil size on uh, more near versus more uh, distance vision. 
Uh, the question is, doesn't increasing cupel size in a center distance design give more area for distance vision and therefore less near? Can you just kind of go back to that slide and kind of uh, explain that? I'm going back right now. And that comment is correct. I'm assuming this is the, um, this is the uh, slide that they were interested in um, and the like there. Um, and so, um, oh yeah, I'm sorry about that. That actually is a mistake. Thank you for pointing that out there. The, uh, the 3.6 to 3.4 means that, it, yes, in a centered distance design, um, I've taken, a, taken away some of the distance to help out the near. Uh, sorry, when I was preparing the slide, I was actually thinking about something else. So my apologies, I'll have to fix that slide. Uh, but yeah, just fix that in your notes on my apologies there. So in this particular case, you're absolutely right. On a center distance design, the uh, decrease from the 3.6 default down to the 3.4 millimeter size that I actually chose for this gave a little bit more uh, near vision uh, to that particular eye than distance vision by about 10%. So again, it was about a 60-40 split uh, from where it had come from. Now, bear in mind though, this is all relative to the patient pupil size. So uh, for example, if this patient's pupil size is at uh, 4.8 or larger, let's say it was a 5.0 millimeter uh, pupil size, they're not gonna have any near vision whatsoever. Uh, with that, with that uh, chosen 3.4, there's, there's, there's just, there's just too much that that's interfering with the quality of the uh, of the vision there, or they're going to have near and complain incessantly that the distance just looks awful. So either one of those two are possible uh, as complaints, uh, and again, the reason has to do because these sizes are relative to whatever the patient's pupil size actually is. So in this particular case, the, pa the patient's pupil was 3.7, and you might be thinking, well, they're only getting 0.3 really for the near. In practicality, that's not the way it works. And so that's why it's a little deceptive here. And what I've noticed when I've done the consults is that, for example, let's say we had chosen 3.4 and uh, they're not getting enough near. They're okay with the distance vision, but they're complaining that the near doesn't look very good. I'll see, I'll see the doctor change the 3.4 to like 2.5. Well, changing it to 2.5, trust me, they're not going to have any distance vision at that point. They'll be happy with the near, but they're not going to be very happy with the distance. So you have to be very, very careful about making these changes. And that really was the idea behind this slide. So I do apologize for the, uh, the error in the notation there. It's always good to have people keeping us on our toes. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Uh, on a similar kind of focus to discussing center distance and center near, do you default to center distance when you're doing scleral multifocals? No. Um, on a, excuse me. On a center, on a uh, scleral multifocal, I will default to a center near uh, because of the um, absolutely almost non-existent movement of that lens, the center nears tend to work much better on those. That being said, I do have a, a few a few scleral wearers in center distance, but that's one where I'll sort of default to a center near design before center distance. Being that this lecture was about corneal GP multifocals, corneal GPs, 100%, I will default to a center distance until proven that I cannot get that lens to work. Perfect. All right. Next question. Uh, in order to achieve the 10 to 15 micron edge lift in the periphery, uh, where do you adjust that in the wave software? Black ball. That's the, that's the black ball adjustments uh, that are going to be on the screen there. So that's really what's controlling what's going on at the very, very edge there, that edge lift. And you do want to make certain you have a of a proper peripheral pool. Uh, in this particular case, when it was down at what, 6.3 or 6.2, uh, that's actually a little bit too tight. You're just not getting enough uh, enough flow of fluorescein. Um, when, you, when you're, uh, got fluorescein in on the eye, you could see that it's really being cut off 
uh, out there. And so you do want to lift that up a little bit. Perfect. Okay. Uh, you talked about a number of considerations that might make your multifocal, you know, uh, more difficult to uh, get good vision with. Are there any kind of hard cutoffs that you use as a contraindication? Um, no, uh, really not. If 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 there are presbyope, they're indicated. And that's pretty much the philosophy I go in and, and use this. Interestingly, I just I just had a case uh, just to share. This this was a patient I saw today. Um, the patient's got fairly advanced keratoconus, and um, I've had him in a multifocal. It's got to be 15 years already. He's um, it's about he's right around 70 years of age, but he's still a practicing cardiologist. And a lot of what he does is you know reading you know, whether it's EKGs or whatever, but he has a lot of computer work that he does. And um, he had been complaining um, to me, not because of the multifocals, because of the keratoconus, uh, that he just was having a, a little bit of a tough time there. And so here, a patient of 15 plus years decided he would go see another doctor. And so he went to another physician and I'm just going to zip down to the end here. I went to another physician, and that physician didn't even try a multifocal, put him right into monovision. Well, in addition to the poor results of monovision, uh, he also had a bad fitting lens. He's wearing corneal lenses. And he was having a, a very, very difficult time wearing uh, both lenses, but in particular, one, one, one of the lenses was causing him uh, to have a very shortened wear schedule. So he came back to me. Uh, after going through that failed experiment there, and his corneas were a wreck from the pair of lenses. So it took me about three to four months to rehabilitate his corneas first. And then while I was doing that, I put him into monovision because I didn't want to mess around with the multifocal at that point. Um, he came in today, and in the monovision, I have his distance eye at 2015, so he's doing fantastic despite the advanced keratoconus. And on the other eye, he's really a J1 at near, and he's not satisfied with the vision. Um, and he begged me, please put me back in the multifocals again. So just before this lecture, I was designing up a pair of multifocals for him once again, uh, despite the fact that he has advanced keratoconus, despite the fact that we had a little bit of trouble before that even gave him the impetus to go seek out another physician, uh, and he pleaded with me to put him back into the multifocals again because he said overall that still was way better than the monovision that he's been in now for about six months, uh, three months with the other doctor and three to four months while I was rehabilitating him. So the answer is no. I really do consider multifocals the go-to if they're presbyopic. Um, now, I, I guess I should say the one that gives me pause, it's not a hard cutoff, but the one that gives me pause is the monocular patient. If we only have one eye to work with, sometimes that, that can be a real challenge to meet the needs of that particular individual. Uh, and again, I just had another case. Not only is she only one-eyed, because the other eye is lost due to retinal problems, but the good eye has retinal problems that doesn't let me get any better than 2060. And I still attempted a multifocal on that eye. I was able to get her to about 2040 in the distance and J1, but there's just not enough retina there. So that that ended up, despite the fact that we really worked hard, I just could not get a multifocal to work on that particular eye. But th that still wasn't a hard no. It, it was a relative, relative no. Perfect. I have one final question, which I'll address, uh, which is asking to kind of go back and look at the uh, way that you choose uh, hold on. Let me just start the uh, question over again. What's a good default size relative to the patient's pupil size in terms of the uh, optic zone? I wanted to say that this is being recorded, and if there's anything that you missed, you can go back and review it. Uh, but go ahead and just address that again quickly before we wrap up here tonight. Are you are you saying the diameter of the lens or the pupil I size? The size of the optic zone. Oh, you mean the location of the red ball? Yes. Right, because it's not an optic zone, and that that really is it's 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 unfortunate that we talk about that 
as an optic zone because it really is not. Um, understand, uh, I'll give you just a little insight to this. Understand that the location of the red ball uh, really defines something uh, very specific. The red ball is everything to the left, just about, I have to qualify that, but everything to the left of the red ball is spherical. Everything to the right ball is aspheric, which means that you're really dividing up the lens between a central spherical and a peripheral aspheric curve. When you go ahead and put the red ball wherever you're going to put it, you're going to create that central spherical optic so that you can have proper visual performance and not have sort of a strange optical performance by aspheric optics, uh, which are over the visual axis. And in the early days of WAVE, by the way, that was an option. And boy, when I say strange, you had some real strange complaints from patients. And so that, that feature was actually taken out uh, and so now that's the reason why everything to the left of the, between the red ball and the black line uh, is really spherical and everything to the right is aspheric, which means that to the right is where you're going to align the lens and to the left is where you're going to deal with optics of the lens. The reason I'll choose 6.0 is that seems to be a very, very good average spot for average corneas when you have average size lenses. If in fact you have a slightly small cornea, let's say this particular cornea was 10.8, then I'd be designing a lens that's probably around 10.5 or 10.4. I might move the red ball in a little bit because I need more of the periphery to align the lens correctly. So I'm creating essentially a larger alignment fitting area at the sacrifice of an optic area centrally. So that's how the diameter may have influence on the red ball horizontal location. But like I said, if you're dealing with a normal cornea and it's an average eye, the 6070 sort of default go-to for these types of lenses works very, very well. Uh, and so that really is, if, you, if you're just getting started, that's a fantastic place to start. Okay, I did get a clarification while you were answering that. Uh, the clarification was, uh, what size do we set, uh, say we're doing a center distance, what radius do you set that center distance to relative to pupil size? What radius do you set the center? I'm sorry, you've lost me. I don't okay. understand. Uh, the clarification so, was not clarifying. Okay, let me let me phrase that better. So you have the radius of your center distance zone. How what do you mean do you by radius? That? You mean, do you mean the, 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 the actual, what would be like equivalent to a base curve? Yeah, how do you decide what percentage of the center is gonna be center distance versus center or versus like peripheral near? Oh, that's actually on that pupil calculator. Got it. Okay, so that that's not the question that I answered here. That was a different question. So that goes back to our pupil size selection on the lens. Got it. Okay, so let me get back up over there on that pupil size. Just give it a second here. And just about there. That's over here. Okay, so what you first want to do is figure out exactly what is the patient's pupil size in moderate light. Um, and there are many, many different ways to do that. Um, and actually, it doesn't matter which way you do it, just as long as you're consistent every time, because you'll figure out what your internal fudge factor is going to be based on whatever you're using as far as a light source. I'm able to measure uh, pupil size very accurately in moderate light directly off the topography from Scout because I've done it for so many years uh, that once I take a look at the Scout's pupil size, I know what I need to do in terms of balancing out the pupil uh, of the lens for the balance between distance and near. And so what I've learned over time is that generally speaking, when I have a pupil measured on my scout, which is moderate light from the instrument itself and ambient light from the near, the near, uh, um, the, the near light that's on the stand, but with the room lights shut out, 
when I get a pupil in those lighting conditions and I have a pupil between roughly 3.3 to about 3.8, for me, 3.4 works very well. Now, you may have a, a slightly different set of circumstances that you're measuring the pupil under. You may be doing it in free space with a with a, uh, a ruler. You may do it on the Pentacam, which the lighting is very different uh, than, for example, on the Scout. Uh, I tend to find that the pupil size tends to measure a little bit smaller on the Scout versus, I'm sorry, on the Pentacam versus the Scout. So, for example, where I had that sort of 3.2, 3.3 to 3.8, on the scout, I might shift my scale on the pentacam somewhere to maybe around 2.7 to maybe about 3.4 or so. And then I might consider a 3.4 pupil size on the lens. So you're going to have to figure out whatever testing you're going to, to use to cre uh, create the measurement for this pupil consistently from patient to patient to patient what your actual fudge factor is going to be, and then how that's going to translate to a pupil size on the wave screen so that you can design it properly uh, sort of at the get-go. And yeah, at the beginning, you're going to miss a few. Uh, you know, for example, you may measure it on your uh, Medmont, and you measure the pupil size at, uh, let's say, 4.0, and it turns out that that tends to be under a little bit darker conditions. Uh, I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying let's say it is. And you've designed up a 3.6 millimeter uh, pupil on the lens, and they have absolutely no reading whatsoever. And it may be that that's because the pupil that Medmont is reporting is just slightly off compared to what I might have gotten from the Scout or from the Pentacam or whatever. So you're going to have to figure out wh what methodology you're going to use to measure pupil size and then be consistent from patient to patient so that you have a reference and then you'll know what sort of your sliding scale needs to be when you're designing up the, the uh, multifocal optics. Hopefully that answers the question. It does. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Muller, for all the expertise that you are bringing to everyone in our audience tonight. We all appreciate uh, how much effort you put into all of these presentations and how willing you are just to answer the questions that everyone has. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, this was recorded just in case you want to go back and review everything. And just thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much, Carver, for uh, moderating. And thanks for everyone who's coming out. And I wish you all the best of success getting these lenses into your practice and designing for virtually every presbyope that walks in the door because uh, they'll, they'll be happy and you'll be very happy as well to be able to provide those services. Thanks again for coming out tonight. I'll look forward to seeing you at the next WAVE webinar.